Hi, this is Gail, your classmate, and this is my mother, Shirley Howard. And for the sake of my report on uh, colorism, which is another name for intra-racism, I wanted to interview my mother because she grew up during the time that the uh, setting of the story, A Lesson Before Dying, was written. And I wanted to get her perspective on what she experienced as far as colorism uh, when she was growing up. Um, so, Mom, what was your first recollection of having to deal with, with colorism? Well, I think the first time that I really noticed it was they had a detergent called gold dust. And uh, they had two little black images of black children on it. And my mother called my brother and I gold dust twins. So that's when I first knew that it was a difference in color because I, I never knew. Right. And then I guess the next time was when I started school. Mm -hmm. uh, my brother and I was both dark, and my two sisters were lighter. And they had long hair, and uh, I had short, kinky hair, which was a minus for me. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we started school, and I noticed that all the kids that was light-skinned was always called on in the class, was always given the good parts. And the dark-skinned kids only got what was left over, like a, flower, a pack of rats or a little wow. of flowers and stuff like that. But the light-skinned people got the singing parts, the talking parts, mm -hmm. and everything. And every spring we had an operator in our school, and all of the other, all the light-skinned kids got all the good parts. And the only reason why my brother got a part in the play was because he could sing. But if he couldn't sing, he wouldn't have got no good part in it at all. Uh, that was the beginning of it. So from that point, I mean, so even when you were a child, you kind of internal, internalized that there was something wrong. Yes. Um, I noticed that when I was looking at different TV stars and Hollywood stars and, and people like that, that um, the ones that stood out the most were Lena Horne and um, Diane Carroll, um, the, another one I have, Josephine Baker. Um, you know, they were all light skin. Mm -hmm. And then I noticed for the men, the, there was uh, the only dark ones that were popular were like um, Bojangles. Mm -hmm. And although he was talented, it's almost like since he was dark skin, he had to almost be a caricature of, you know, a dignified man. Mm -hmm. Did you um, do anything to try to compensate in any way for, for being dark skin? Did you? Yes, I just... Well, I felt like all I was, because I was dark, I didn't fit in. Mm -hmm. uh, I had to sit back and let all the others do whatever they needed to do. And I never would volunteer for anything because I didn't want to be hurt. Wow. And it was so noticeable that uh, the color thing was so bad. And even to my oldest sister, because she was lighter, she called me all kind of names and everything. So I had no support at home for it or at school. I was just caught in between the limbo of being dark skinned. Mm -hmm. So you had the racism with from even within your own family. Yes, yes. Your community. Yes. And then not to mention the racism from the white community. That's right. So, I mean, I, I just can't imagine what it would grow up to feel like you pretty much had no options. No. Wow. Okay. Um, what did you think, like, okay, once after you grew up, and obviously you've grown up to be a, a beautiful woman, um, did you ever, and, and I know this because I, I've seen pictures of you, did you ever perceive yourself as being beautiful? No. I didn't think I could be. Mm -hmm. What did you think the first time, because I experienced it some when I was growing up, what did you think the first time I came to you 
and told you I had been picked on because of being dark skinned? It hurt me because I didn't want to see you have to go through that. I knew that when you were coming up, it wasn't as bad as it was when I was coming up. But uh, that really hurt me. I was, I was, uh, because I had two dark children and one lighter skin. And uh, I knew that that would be a difference between how they was treated. I think a lot of people that, when I first started even talking about doing this report in my class, a couple of people that I spoke to, they were surprised that there is such a thing as colorism in our community. And it still exists. Oh, yeah. You know, although not as, as, as bad as, as it was for you. But um, uh, I just, um, is there anything else you'd like to add? Well, if you know, if you want to hear where they came from, mm -hmm. it's because during slavery, black women worked in the home. Mm -hmm. The white master would have sex with them and they had babies. Mm -hmm. The babies was mixed so they were light. They was kept in the house. They called them half inward. Uh -huh. And they was better than the black people I didn't meet on the land mm -hmm. because they was in the house and they were light skinned. Mm -hmm. So that was just about drilled in our minds that those light skinned people in the home was better than us out here in the fields. So you so, didn't believe it? Yes. You believed it? Yes. So mm -hmm. it just carried through. And when I heard that, I thought, well, that's the reason why people always say, she's so pretty, she's light skinned. She's light skinned. Because of that, from the beginning, mm -hmm. that's what we was made to feel like. So they could have been, you know, ugly on the inside or dumb as a box of rocks, but it still. Make no difference. Wow. And then as I went into high school, the teachers were very prejudiced too. Mm -hmm. that because uh, it was like if. If I bought material for homemaker models and it was pretty and nice, I bought lace for it to make an apron and everything. And the other girl bought in some material and uh, she was light skinned. Mm -hmm. And she just made over what she had and everything. And I just sat there wondering why come she don't say anything about my material. Right. And those were the kind of things that I went through all the way through high school. Wow. It was never, I never had no, I did get to uh, wrap the maypole. That was the closest I come to getting anything that wasn't a rat or something in the field, something like that. Mm. So, just like I said, I never expected anything because I was dark. Did they ever, Did were the teachers, um, were most of them light-skinned? Yes. Did they ever mention to you like when it came to talking about furthering your education, did they ever talk to darker skinned kids about going to college or anything like that? So what, what options did they leave open for you? What, did, what kind of things did they tell you to pursue? Um, they didn't. They didn't give us, you know, anything about it. And I finished high school, mm -hmm. but no one ever uh, came to me and offered me anything or talked to me about anything. But the lighter skinned kids mm -hmm. got to go to college. Got to do what they do. I mean, this is unbelievable. It's, it's unfathomable yes. that, you know, you, you've obviously, you and, and so many others have so much potential, and it was never even tapped into because even the teachers didn't even consider that it was a possibility. Well, I admire your courage, and, and you've been a very good mom and a very good role model. <laughs> but, you know, it did make me so that I took pride in myself as trying to fix myself up mm -hmm. to look as good as I could. Mm -hmm. uh, I tried to keep my hair done. I tried to do anything so that I wouldn't be looked down on. And once in a while, I might get a compliment, but not for itself. And... So that is the reason why that I guess I'm like I am now. Mm -hmm. uh, 
I tried to stay just a little bit above the line <laughs> so that I'll be passable. Wow. Yeah. Well, you've more than passed. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much, Mom. And I know everybody's going to be really interested in hearing this interview. And, um, you know, if there's any questions or anything anybody has after, then I'll bring them back to you and, and get back to them with your answers. Okay. Thanks again, Mom. <laughs>